Cool. All right. Well, I'll um, how about I'll get started. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Common Out, and thank you so much for joining us today. I am um, I'm Corey. If you don't know who I am, um, I'm so glad that you guys are able to join us on Zoom today. I'm really excited. Uh, we we're able to meet together. Um, hope you enjoyed that little uh that little interaction at the start and uh, getting to see my garage. Um. Where am I up to? Um, and uh, now just to let you guys know, um, we'll be recording uh, this coin hour so that others who can't make it today uh, this time are still able to watch it. But it'd be really um, helpful for the sake of building community at AAC that if you'd be able to come onto the Zoom call and tune in. Um, and I feel like it's way better to be learning from the Bible uh, together as a community at AAC. Uh, now, I hope uh, sometime this semester we will be able to meet in person, but for the foreseeable future and definitely for the next four weeks, we will be meeting online. Uh, this term in Corn Hour, we're going to be delving into God's word. We'll be looking at the book of Titus and thinking about what is a healthy life. Um, then we're going to be going through the book of Mark, uh, which will correlate with the Bible studies for this term. Then we're going to be going through uh, going to go through a different section to the Bible studies and we're going to be going through two ways to live, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and just uh, one last thing in regards to Zoom etiquette, we encourage all of you to have your cameras on throughout. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, Colin now we want to build a community for EOC and we feel that th this is an easier way of doing this uh, with our cameras on. Uh, also, I've spoken to Simon, uh, who's preaching, and he's told me they'd rather be preaching to a screen full of people as opposed to a screen full of black boxes. Um, however, we do understand that sometimes, and I know this very well, having an unstable internet connection is not always possible and having our cameras on may not be always possible. Um, other ideas, uh, we recommend that you have a Bible, a physical Bible in front of you um, and a pen and paper to take down notes. Um, also closing other apps or programs so that you can concentrate during this common hour. I think that would be very helpful. And now that I've got all sort of the introduction and formalities out of the way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to our speaker for today and our new staff worker, Simon. Um, so we are going to spend a bit of time getting to know him. So hi, Simon. Um, we are so excited to have you on board. Um, my first question is, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your family? Yeah, sure should say hey everyone uh, it's great to see so many of you guys here uh shame can't be in person but still good to see your faces yep as Corey said I'm Simon I know people call me Cy or Sim or Sangers that's what my high school friends used to call me uh feel free to call me those or another nickname or plain old Simon's good too um yep uh, I'm one of the new staff workers that have started this semester a uh, little bit about myself I grew up in a Christian family but took my faith probably seriously around year eight. Um, but I should tell you about my family. Let me show you photos because that will probably be the best way to do it. Uh, here we go. I'm going to share a screen. So this is me and my wife, Fee. Um, we met at uni. We were both involved in the Christian group. We both grew heaps there. So that's why I'm so keen about uh, joining you guys. We both studied physio. So shout out to the physios out there. Um, we properly met at NTE, and for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a really awesome camp for uni students at the end of the year, which I encourage you to go to. Fee said she'd never date a physio, and yet now, here we are, we've been married for eight years. Uh, so, you know, I must have been a pretty good catch. That's what I tell myself anyway. Uh, here are my kids. I've got three kids. Liam in the middle there, he's two years old, and tw our twin girl Zoe on the left and Maddie on the right. They've just turned four months, so you can imagine it's been a bit of a busy year and it's been a bit crazy in lockdown as well. But I really hope they get to meet you sometime when lockdown finishes. Um, maybe you might be able to tell by the photo, one of my passions and the few things that I get to do in my spare time now is follow the Sydney Swans. Um, so I don't know if there's any supporters out there, but sometimes I can be a little bit more passionate about making Sydney Swan supporters than actual followers of Jesus which is probably the wrong way around, but you know, that you gotta have passions, right? Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm sure we'll get to find out more about each other as we go along. I'm keen to get to know all of you guys too. 
Cool. Thanks for that, Simon. Um, and second question would, what kind of things will you be doing as a staff worker and what are you excited about? Yeah, um, so I'll be uh, I'll be teaching you guys at Common Hour from God's Word uh, every week. Um, and so pretty keen about that. Uh, I know, yeah, having a regular Common Hour isn't something we've had this year, so it'll be really good to hopefully keep that regular at this time slot. Um, but also be doing things like tr providing training and different things like evangelism, uh, supporting and partnering with the, your exec as they make decisions for this ministry, but also keen to just get alongside you guys as students as we do this work of proclaiming the gospel at ACU North Sydney. Um, and hopefully just even if it's online for now, just getting to know uh, some of the rest of you too. Um, but I think I mentioned before that, yeah, uni was a really big time of growth for me and my wife. And so, yeah, I just want to say, I think uni is just such a great opportunity for you guys as students to get involved in uni ministry. Um, I reckon there's no better time in your life where you have such freedom in three things, time, thought, and relationship uh, to think about the Bible for yourself and discover whether the claims that it brings are true or, or to grow more as a Christian. Um, let me, yeah, I can flesh that out. So time, you know, we've got so much more time as uni students uh, to spend coming along to ESC activities, to be trained up, to love God and serve others. Uh, there's freedom and thought, like it's a very different world from high school where you're spoon fed, you actually have a space to think for yourself uh, to discover whether the, and consider whether the claims of the Bible are true. Um, and relationship, like, yeah, yeah, there's more chances to build a relationship uh, and spend time with like minded people. And yeah, so time, thought, and relationship are things that you guys have hopefully a bit more than any other time in your life. And I reckon there's definitely no better time than you need to tell your friends about Jesus because yeah, there's just so many more people who have that freedom, time, thought, and relationship who yeah, should be hearing about Jesus. Um, and so at Common Hour here, I'm going to aim to preach the gospel so that everyone can see how important it is to meet Jesus and let that be the thing that changes our lives. So yeah, use that as a, as a reason to invite your friends along, but for you to keep coming along so you can be changed by the gospel too. Back to you, Corey, wherever you've disappeared to. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Um, lastly, Simon, this is a question I didn't, uh, we didn't plan, but how can we be praying for you? Yeah. Um, I reckon it's a pretty heavy task just being, uh, yeah, giving God's word to you guys every week at Common Out. It takes a lot of time to prep, but just, yeah, I want to make sure that I'm preaching it rightly truthfully and faithfully so just pray that i can keep um working out my responsibility well in that regards awesome well thanks for thanks for that simon um would i be able to throw zach harold under the bus and would you be able to pray for simon please oh, of course i can <laughs> uh let's pray uh Helen Father, uh, we just thank you uh, for Simon. Thank you for uh, his eagerness to uh, be serving you uh, and for his willingness to uh, come and support EOC through training uh, and to get to know us uh, better. I pray for this uh, time, the common hour. I pray that you really bless it, that it is focused around you and your word. I pray that you help Simon faithfully uh, preach uh, your word and help us to be really good listeners help us to really learn what you want us to learn from this time. And yeah, I just, yeah, really lift up, um, yeah, um, this time and ask uh, that you help us encourage one another to keep coming, keep thriving off God's word. But yeah, ultimately, we thank you for the fellowship that we're able to share and that that can be centered around you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Zach. Um, now I'm going to be doing our Bible reading for us today from Titus chapter one. Um, I'll just give you guys a moment to find that. All right, so Titus chapter one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies 
promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of our God, our Saviour. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you may put up what is re reminded into order and remain and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or in insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or a drunkard or a violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are, they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Cool. Thanks, Corey. Um, yeah, keep your Bibles open in front of you as we go through, uh, as we go through God's word. Uh, but let's pray as we start. Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to learn from your word today in Common Hour. I pray that we can all concentrate even in a Zoom context and that we can understand how your grace shapes us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what is a healthy life? I think that's something everyone wants to know. And that's our series title for the book of Titus. But I'm keen to get a little bit of interaction before we get into it. So uh, using your emoticons, give us a thumbs up if you think you've led a healthy life during lockdown. Who thinks they've led a healthy life during lockdown? No one. <laughs> no one's led a healthy life. Well, fair enough. All right. Well, I saw this meme the other day, so I'm going to share my screen again. All right. There's three choices of lockdown. What will come out with as after lockdown finishes? Either a hunk, a chunk, or a drunk. Hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory. And I think for me, a chunk is definitely what I'm going to come out as with a COVID dad bod. But what is a healthy life? This is a question we're going to ask each week as we explore the book of Titus. I think Titus helps us to understand what is a healthy life because the word healthy appears throughout. Now, you might not notice it straight away. You might instead notice the word sound uh, in your translation, but healthy or whole is another meaning for the word sound. And each week, I think we're going to see that Titus points us to the fact that it is God's grace that shapes a healthy life. But what constitutes a healthy life to the world around us? Well, it's a sign it's purely physical, eating well, exercising so you can feel good about your body or to prevent illness or dying early. The World Health Organization defines it as a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. Let me say that again, a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease. And there are certain behaviors that help to shape a healthy life. But do you know what the limiting factor in this definition is? There's a major limiting factor, and it's a pretty significant limiting factor. It's that their goal is to avoid disease or early death. That's all there is to it, nothing else. There is no hope or future beyond this world. But I think the Bible tells us that a healthy life is not just one of physical health, but it includes our spiritual health too. I think the Bible tells us that a healthy life is not just one of physical health, but it includes our spiritual health too. And so in Titus chapter one, 
we're going to discover that who teaches us about healthy living plays a big part in us having a healthy life. So today's title is, What is a Healthy Teacher? And we're going to think about this in three points. So if you're taking notes, here they are. Point number one, introductions. Point number two, revelations and the revealer. Point number three, teachers, healthy and the sick. So introductions, revelations and the revealer, and teachers, healthy and the sick. So point number one, introductions. Well, intros are important. We get to know someone by how they introduce themselves. You see what they think is important to share about themselves, what they think others need to know to understand them. Hopefully you got to know a little bit about me from Corey introducing me and what I talked about. And so as we come to the letter of Titus, it could be so easy to just skim over the first few verses. But I think we learn a lot about Paul from these verses and what he is convinced constitutes a healthy life. But most importantly, we learn a lot about God and his grace that has appeared to us. So we're not going to gloss over it as we might be tempted to do, but we'll spend a fair bit of our talk on it. And so have your Bibles open in front of you and let's read from Titus chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Verse 1, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. Well, we learned two key things about Paul. Paul, who has been described as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, which means he's someone who's been sent by Jesus. And what are these two key things? Well, firstly, I think we learn what he's been sent to do, his mission. And secondly, we learn about the reason for his mission. And so firstly, his mission. We see this in the second half of verse 1. He's been sent for the sake of the faith of God's elect. Basically, those who are being called to be part of God's family. Now, this letter may have been addressed to Titus and Christians in Crete, but Paul's mission is for the sake of all of God's elect. That means it's also for the sake of our faith here at EOC as people who are part of God's family or those who will be, become part of God's family in the future. And as we read on, we see that faith involves knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. And we're going to see throughout the book of Titus that faith is intricately tied to a knowledge of the truth and to godliness. And so I want to propose that a healthy faith is healthy doctrine, which is another term for a knowledge of the truth, which goes hand in hand with fruitful works, another term for godliness. Let me say that again. A healthy faith is healthy doctrine, hand in hand with fruitful works together. And this is a key idea that we'll see throughout Titus. And we'll see that faith, doctrine, and works, they're all key ingredients in having a healthy life. So Paul's mission is to grow the faith of God's elect. But what's the reason behind why he's been sent? And the reason for his mission is in verse 2, in the hope of eternal life. Why do we need a healthy life? Well, it's not actually for now. It's for the future. People who believe in God are those who live in hope. This world and this life, it's passing, it's temporary. But the way we live now points to what we're hoping for in the future. Life forever with our God. The Tokyo Olympics are upon us. I don't know if you guys have been watching. Thousands of athletes taking part in the pinnacle of world competition for many sports. Many would have dreamed of representing their country and competing in the Olympics from a very young age. Their lives would have been shaped in the hope of making the Olympics and maybe, maybe just even winning gold. Countless hours, probably even years of preparation, training, changing diets, giving up aspects of normal life would have been involved in turning this hope into a reality. What you hope for, it impacts your whole life. And so as we think about a healthy life and what it is, I think we'll see that it's shaped by the hope of eternal life. Well, we're up to point two, revelations and the revealer. How do we know that Paul's mission and his reason wasn't just carried out in delusion? How do we know that this hope of eternal life, it's not just a bogus dream? Well, let me tell you why it isn't. 
because it was a revelation. And more specifically, the person who revealed this hope is God. Let's think about the importance of revelation, but more specifically the revealer. Revelation, or maybe in your translation, it's manifested or appeared. It simply means what was unknown is made known. And a revelation causes change. When I revealed my name to you, that was important because it brought about a change. It creates the potential for us to be in a relationship. Something pretty hard to do without knowing someone's name. You won't be able to figure out a nickname for me if you don't really know my name. Or maybe in a bigger way, when it was revealed that we were going to be in lockdown, it changed your plans for the holidays, for uni, and how we we're going to run ESC activities. Revelations cause change. And in this instance, the revealer is also very important. Much like we found out what was important to Paul in the introduction, we also find out three important things about God in the intro. So let's read from verse two and three. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. What do we find out about God? Well, firstly, he never lies. Secondly, he promised eternal life before the ages began. And thirdly, at the proper time, he revealed his word. Firstly, God never lies. And when it comes to having a knowledge of the truth, that seems like an important thing. I don't know about you, but I'd be lying if I said that I'd never told a lie in my whole life. I'm not sure if any of you could ever say that or if anyone ever other than God could say they'd never lied. I mean, I guess maybe one way you could never lie is if you never said anything at all or if you never made a promise to anyone about something. But you know what's amazing about God? He's made so many promises to us in the Bible and he's never failed to fulfill any of his promises. So not only does he never lie, he also has power as God to keep his promises. And you know what that means? It means you can completely trust him. He won't ever mislead or trick you. It's not like most relationships where it takes a while to build up a sense of trust to see if they're genuine people who won't hurt you. God never lies. You can trust him. And we'll soon see that this is particularly important in the island of Crete, where Titus is facing opposition from false teachers. God never lies. Secondly, God promised eternal life before the ages began. Before the start of time, before he created the world, eternal life between God and his people, that was part of the plan. And this is coming from someone who doesn't lie. So it's a promise that we can trust in much like how the Bible shows that God fulfills the rest of his promises. This gives us assurance, something we might never be able to find anywhere else in other religions or other places. God promised eternal life. And thirdly, at the proper time, God revealed his word. Now, as we go through Titus, you might notice this word revealed in each chapter. Notice that the word revealed is past tense. It's something that happened beforehand. And this word is important because this revelation involves an aspect of God's grace to us. It involves an aspect of God's grace to us. And this revelation, it caused change. God's grace changed the life of Paul and many others. In chapter one, what is revealed is God's word, the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, he rose to defeat death, and so that those who believe in him could have eternal life. If you've heard the gospel before, you know that that is a life-changing revelation. You've seen it in your own lives. If you haven't heard the gospel before, well, let me tell you, it's a life-changing revelation, and I encourage you to find out more. And the gospel is true. It is the word of God who never lies. It's self-authenticating. We see this in the Bible, and it's true historically. Happy to chat more about this later. If you have further questions about this, feel free to message me or get in contact with me somehow. But the gospel reveals God's grace to us, his plan for an eternal relationship between his followers and himself, how he saved us and so much more. 
this revelation has to change lives. And so keep an eye out for this word revelation or revealed or manifested or appeared as you read through Titus. It's key to understanding God's grace to us. As Christians, our present lives are changed by the revelation of God's grace to us in the past, but also shaped by our hope for the future. We have the good news of Jesus. We know that we have been saved, but we also have a hope for the future, eternal life with God. These are the reasons for how we live now. It's a very different ethic to the world around us. And so I want to invite you to explore and discover for yourself how this revelation can and should change your life, even as you compare it to other ethics that the world might teach us. We're up to point three, teachers, healthy and the sick. We spent a long time on the first three verses, but I think it's important because it shows that it's the revelation of God's grace that changes and shapes how we live. God's grace found in God's word is what Paul preaches for the sake of the faith of other believers. This is what Paul wanted to shape the church at Crete. Paul writes to Titus to encourage him in this work in growing the church. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 5, he gives us some context to the situation in Crete. We see that Titus has two tasks. Firstly, to put what remained into order, and secondly, to appoint elders in every town. The church of Crete was in its infant stage, but it still required healthy structures to help it grow in the right way. And so I think it draws some similarities to us as a young growing group at EAC. We've only been established recently, we've faced some struggles through COVID last year and even now. Only two years ago, there were about 10 regulars. Uh, as I look around the room, Zoom room here, there's, there's more than that, and there's so many more in our Bible studies that have joined up already. Uh, you know, we've got some young leaders, but we're hoping to train up more. Rach and I have only just joined this team this year as staff workers to support you guys in this ministry. And so we're still a young, growing ministry, which I think bears some close similarities to the situation in Crete. Well, one thing that Paul knew was required to help grow the young church were elders. And the role of these elders is found in verse 9. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound or healthy doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Elders are required to teach God's word truthfully and also stop those who teach it falsely. More can be said about their specific role within a church, but to put it simply and to help us understand this passage, elders are like healthy teachers. And as uni students, I'm sure that I don't have to convince you that a good teacher makes a world of difference in your learning. I'm sure you can tell pretty quickly which of your lectures are good not necessarily just from which classes you're willing to skip or maybe fall asleep in. Am I right? What does Titus teach us about what makes a healthy teacher? Well, there are a list of qualifications for an elder from verse 6 to 8. So let's read that. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, I don't think this is an exhaustive list, but I think what it points to is that character is of great importance to being a healthy teacher. And verse 9 points out that he must hold firm to the teaching of the trustworthy word. And so like we saw in verse 1, knowledge of the truth is intricately linked to godliness. It shows a healthy faith. And your character is an outflow of your faith, doctrine, and works. And for a teacher, having a healthy faith with healthy doctrine hand in hand with fruitful works is even more important because they are God's steward. They've been entrusted with this task of pointing people towards the truth that is found in God's word. And this makes sense. If you had a teacher who didn't believe in what they were teaching or maybe didn't know enough about what they were teaching or maybe didn't live out what they taught, well, you probably wouldn't really want them as your teacher. It looked a bit like if you rocked up to the gym and your personal trainer was grossly overweight. A healthy teacher is one who actually lives by healthy truth. And as I teach you guys here at Common Hour, I hope that I'm living the life of a healthy teacher. 
but it's also something I want you guys to test for yourselves, which is why I think it's so important for each of you to have your Bibles open in front of you as I teach you from God's word so that you can hopefully see that I'm not speaking my own words, but I'm speaking God's words to see that I'm living by a healthy doctrine. And as we get to know each other better, then hopefully my character and my works match my doctrine and show my faith. If it helps to start with, you've seen a picture of my family, one wife, three kids, tick that box, right? I mean, could you really accuse those cute little munchkins of debauchery or insubordination? Well, actually, you'd be surprised at how simple disobedient a child can be even from birth. Oh man, those tantrums. Shows that our very nature is sinful. But a key phrase to note in this list of characteristics of a healthy teacher is above reproach. It appears twice. Once in verse 6, when talking about how the elder relates to his family in his private life, and once in verse 7, when talking about how the elder relates to his public ministry. Now, above reproach also means blameless. Take note, it doesn't mean sinless or perfect, because we know that no one is sinless other than Jesus. So what's the distinction? Well, I want to suggest blameless gives the sense of living in a way where no one can accuse you of wrongdoing so that there is no stumbling block to the gospel. Blameless so that there is no distraction from the main attraction. That's Jesus. Blameless so that you can help others hear the gospel. And it can be so easy to try and test the limits and rely on your own self-control before you step into sin. I mean, things all of you might have to face could be things like whether you you should sleep over at your boyfriend or girlfriend's place. It's what everyone else does, right? You know, nothing might happen, but is it appropriate for someone seeking to be blameless? Or maybe drinking. You might want to test the limits and stop before you get drunk. The Bible doesn't talk about testing your limits. It tells us to flee from sin. And you might not fall into sin, but to be blameless would mean not even putting yourself in a situation where someone could accuse you of wrongdoing because we really don't want anything to distract from the message of the gospel. And so particularly for a healthy teacher, their character in both their public and private life, it should match so that nothing can take away from what they're teaching about Jesus. And so as I serve here at EOC, I hope to model a life where my faith matches my words and my actions. But I hope to model this life not in order that you follow me, because I'm still a sinner, but so that I can point you to the gospel, to the true leader to follow, Jesus. Because as the rest of Titus 1 shows, Paul is very much aware that there are false or sick teachers out there. Their character doesn't match their teaching. They don't live healthy lives. In verse 12, one of the Cretan prophets even said of their own, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And this stands in stark contrast to our God who never lies. And so for the young church at Crete, it was of utmost importance that they had healthy teachers who taught the truth and lived by the truth. In Crete, there were many sick teachers around them. Verse 11 shows that they were upsetting whole families by their teaching for shameful gain. Verse 14 shows that these are people who have turned away um, from the truth. Paul knows that the church of Crete needs healthy teachers for the sake of their faith. And this stands the test of time. If we seek to live a healthy life, if we want to grow in our faith, we need to learn from healthy teachers. For us as a young growing Christian group, it's of utmost importance that we learn from healthy teachers who teach the truth and live by the truth. For there's still many false teachers out there, some in obvious ways, some in subtle ways. But the way we can tell is if the teacher is living a healthy life one with a healthy faith, which has healthy doctrine, hand in hand with fruitful works. That is a teacher worth listening to. As we wrap up, I think this passage gives us a picture that helps us to understand how important it is to be learning from healthy teachers who point us to the truth. The end of Titus chapter 1 finishes at verse 15 and 16. Let's read it. It says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, Nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. 
we get this picture of pure versus defiled. What goes in is the same as what comes out. Let me show you a picture. All right, picture of pure and defiled water, right? It's pretty obvious which one you drink. We're lucky here in Australia to have good, clean, filtered drinking water. We can drink straight from the tap and we're fine, no problems. For many third world countries, they don't have the same water system or filtration that we do. The water that comes out of their tap, it's polluted, it's defiled with bacteria, with feces, with who knows what. Drinking it leads to sickness. Let's just say, I know this firsthand from an experience I had once in Indonesia from water. I was bedridden for days. And the only time I got up was to run to the toilet. And I only just made it there sometimes. It wasn't very nice. We need to be listening to the right teachers, to healthy teachers who themselves demonstrate a healthy life. Because what goes into you, what you get taught, it shapes your whole life. What is a healthy life? One that is taught by a healthy teacher. So let me suggest two possible points of application. Firstly, are the people that we're learning from modeling a healthy life? This chapter talks about these characteristics and qualities of a healthy teacher. And hopefully it's something that we as a staff, the exec and our growth group leaders live out. It's something we've talked about together and know the importance of creating a culture where we model this healthy life. We wanna be growing EAC in the right way with its foundations in the gospel. But I hope you can also see that these characteristics should be what all Christians strive for in leading a healthy life. And so as each of us seek to live out a healthy life, we can all play a part in growing this ministry at EAC. And secondly, Second point of application, how does the revelation of God's grace to us through his word change and shape our lives? Are we allowing space for the gospel to enter our lives? Are we making time to read and learn from the Bible, both in our own personal quiet times or maybe through our activities here at ESC? I hope we'll see through these three weeks in the book of Titus that a healthy life is one shaped by God's grace to us. If that's something you're not sure about, I invite you to read through Titus with a friend, maybe join a growth group, or keep coming along to Common Hour. Or why not do all three? We're going to keep hearing the truth about the revelation of God's grace to us and how that is the thing that makes a healthy life. Cool. Well, uh, it'd be great after we've heard God's word to spend some time in prayer and so I'm going to hand it over to Rach now, and she's going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Psalm 18 we read, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Lord, we praise you because you are our rock. We take refuge in you. You are our loving God and our fortress, our stronghold and our deliverer. We thank you for your goodness and faithfulness, most clearly displayed in sending Jesus to die so that we can be forgiven by you. Thank you for making a way to defeat sin and death. Please grow in our hearts an even deeper appreciation of how good you are. We pray for nations who are suffering, especially um, through this current um, outbreak of COVID-19. Please relent and bring relief to these nations. Please comfort those who grieve and provide for those who are in need. Strengthen your people as they share their hope in you at this time while suffering their own griefs and trials. We also bring before you the current outbreak in Sydney. We ask that you will bring an end to the pandemic soon and protect healthcare workers and the most vulnerable in the meantime. Please also grant wisdom to the authorities managing this outbreak. In this time of global crisis, we ask that you will help us to remember you and trust you. Most of all, we ask that many people will turn to you in this time. Please 
grant Christians everywhere opportunities to speak the good news about Jesus, our gracious King. And Father, we thank you for the ministry of EOC. We ask that you would help us to prayerfully proclaim Jesus Christ at ACU in North Sydney, and that you would work for us to make and mature disciples of Jesus. We pray that this would be a place where new people will hear about the forgiveness offered by Jesus' death, and they will come to trust in him. We ask that, you would, um, that we would be people who delight in sharing this news with others. And we also ask that through our growth groups, common hour and prayer meetings, you would be bringing us to know you better as we read your word and shaping us to be more like Jesus. As we begin semester on Zoom, we ask that this won't hinder our ministries, but that it might enable new people to take part. And Father, please give us energy and perseverance when we're feeling drained by our time online. And as we heard from Titus today, we thank you that you have promised us the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thank you that you never lie and are completely worthy of our trust. And we thank you for your grace towards us. We ask that you will grow in each of us a healthy faith, shown in healthy doctrine and fruitful works. Help our ministry leaders in particular to live lives that are above reproach. We ask that you will please grow all of us in our faith and our knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And we pray these things knowing that you hear us because of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, well, that's uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you uh, all for joining us. I've just got um, a few announcements uh, for us quickly. So firstly, uh, growth groups, uh, if you haven't already signed up, I encourage you to do so. Uh, you can sign up by filling out the uh, Google form that should be on our social media. If you can't access it, you feel free to ask myself or Simon or Rachel and they'll point you in the right direction. Um, and if you are not currently in one, you should have either started this week or be added to being contacted by your leaders uh, in some way. Our uh, second announcement is prayer meeting. Uh, it's on eight to nine on Thursdays. Again, I strongly encourage you to make an appearance at that. Both prayer and meeting together with believers are two very important things. Um, and the link for that should be on social media and maybe someone is going to post that link in the chat i'm not sure but it should be on our social media um last announcement common hour um so we'll be doing the same thing at the same time next week um and again we'll i imagine we're using the same zoom link um where we'll be going through titus 2 and i hope to see all of you guys there so Again, I just want to thank you all so much uh, for joining us today at Common Hour. Um, today we've learnt from Titus 1, we've learnt about what it means to be a healthy teacher. And we've learned about the importance of faith, about the knowledge of the gospel, um, God's grace, and the hope that we have, which is eternity uh, with God. So I challenge you to think, how are we going to respond to this if these are things that are true are we going to just ignore it or are we going to let this truth shape and change the way that we live so that is all uh for common hour today uh unless if simon or rachel have anything to add i think that concludes our time together and i hope to see you all next week